This show is brought to you by Stifle Marson, advertising, marketing, and design. A full-service agency specializing in manufacturing and industry. Branding, web development, SEO, brochures, PR, and more. Learn more at wegetmfg.com. You are listening to Manufacturing Revival Radio. Spotlighting the innovation, the business savvy, and the entrepreneurial spirit of manufacturers from here at home and around the world. Celebrate the can-do spirit that is bringing manufacturing back. And now, here are your hosts, Todd Schnick and Todd Youngblood. All right, good afternoon and welcome back to Manufacturing Revival Radio. I am your host, Todd Schnick, joined by my friend and colleague, Todd Youngblood. Todd, I love talking to organizations such as we're about to interact with. Well, I do too, because I mean, almost every conversation we have boils down to skills and education, and everybody wants somebody else to do something about it, and we're going to talk to somebody that's actually doing something about it. Here, here. Looking forward to it. Say hello to our guest. Her name is Desiree Crossley. She is the Outreach Coordinator for Amped New Age. Welcome to the show, Desiree. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to have you, Desiree. Thanks for making some time to join us. Uh, before we get into a conversation around Amped NH, take a few seconds and tell us a little bit about you and your background. Well, I, uh, I live in New Hampshire, and I am a proud graduate of the University of New Hampshire. I was a journalism major. I spent uh, just under a decade in journalism, and interestingly enough, about a year before I saw the job posting for this position, I had been editing a press release about our TACT grant, and I thought to myself, what a great initiative that is. And then a year later, there's a, a listing in the newspaper for a job uh, for outreach related to that grant. So I, uh, I made the switch from journalism to uh, marketing and outreach, and here I am. Outstanding. Well, I'm sure the organization is greatly benefiting from you being on board But give us the lowdown on Amped NH. What's it all about? How do you serve in the market? Well, we are the Advanced Manufacturing Partnerships in Education. And what we are is an initiative funded by a $20 million federal grant. That's the TACT grant. And just in case uh, we have 20 minutes to go through the name, it's Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grant. (laughs) Um, <laughs> Got it. We joked that we added AMPT NH because we didn't think we had a big enough acronym. <laughs> <laughs> but we're funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration, and we're made up of all of New Hampshire's community colleges. We have more than 100 advanced manufacturing business leaders who are part of our initiative. They're from all across the straight and bordering states in New England. And we also have on board state workforce agencies and a bunch of other people and groups who support us. And what we do is we provide customized uh, training and education programs to targeted populations, those being job seekers and career builders, with the purpose of strengthening the highly skilled workforce in advanced manufacturing. Well, I really want to dive in on that word, that phrase, customized education. Talk a little bit about how you figure out what kind of education very specifically is required and by whom. That's the best part of the grant, as far as I'm concerned, is that in this initiative, it wasn't, you know, a bunch of of board members and educational leaders putting together a plan that they think would work best. What happened is the plan and for the curricula was started with the uh, industry leaders who were invited into the colleges and then the colleges in turn invited into their facilities. And the question was asked, what's needed and how do we get there? And I, I don't think it's news to a lot of people in our country right now that advanced manufacturing is in serious need of a pipeline of workers who have the right kind of high tech skills to keep up with the technology uh, as it advances. So basically, we uh, formed advisory councils and we said, we know that there is a skills gap and how can we fill it? And that's how the curricula was started. Desiree, it's no surprise to you that over the duration of this show, there has been an awful lot of conversation and dialogue and debate about the role of government. And again, knowing that, you know, there's there's half of the debate is say the you know, government should just stay off and cause enough impact. So but here's an example of a Department of Labor program that, that is frankly, it sounds like it's targeted, laser targeted on solving what, what if you listen to or the guest on our show is one of, if not the biggest challenge is this lack of skilled labor. Talk about the importance of that of that Department of Labor program and, and, and its potential long-term impact. 
Well, manufacturing, I think, is it, it's recognized as, a, as an uh, economic leader. So one thing that's hugely important is for every job added in manufacturing, I believe the, the figure is about almost three more are added in other sectors. The other thing is in New Hampshire, according to a study from 2011, manufacturing, the effect of adding jobs in manufacturing far exceeds um, the effect of adding jobs in other industries economically. So for every 100 jobs you add in manufacturing, the economic uh, impact is estimated to be about $102 million. And that's in New Hampshire alone. Wow. And you compare that to another really, really important sector, and I want to stress this, uh, is tourism. And I don't think anyone in New Hampshire would, um, you know, doubt tourism's important to us. But the estimate, I believe, for tourism was under $30 million. So you can see when you compare those two, and that's just New Hampshire's story, manufacturing is huge for our economy. And what we want to do is keep it there, obviously, and continue to strengthen it. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is to make sure that these manufacturers who, A, are already here, and then also the ones who we're trying to attract into our state, can count on an advanced manufacturing workforce that will be available now and then also in the coming decades. Desiree, I've got a two-part question getting back to the actual curricula. What specifically is needed tactically? I mean, what are these industry leaders that you're partners with asking for specifically in terms of skills? And then what kind of courses are put together? Are they week-long, month-long, six-month-long? Well, to answer the first part of your question, I think the word or the term STEM is becoming more and more popular these days. And you can actually see it's trending on Twitter, which makes me very happy camper. That's science, technology, engineering, and math. And if to answer your question, those are the skills that are needed. Back in the day, and, and one of the challenges we face is perception of manufacturing. And I think if you had asked people 30 years ago what skills are needed in manufacturing, I'm not sure that you would have heard technology. I don't think they would have maybe associated science and engineering. Today, that's exactly what's needed. And what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Well, what's the duration of the typical class? Is it a week? Is it six well, months? Somewhere in between? All over the place? It's all over the place. We have a, not only do we have a variety of industry sector focused programs, but we have a variety of different types of programs. So we offer everything from associate's degree programs all the way through certificates, credit and non-credit. And when I say non-credit, those are offered through dozens of programs, I would say system-wide, that we refer to as either business and training program or workforce development. And those are really fantastic because they can be tailored really to meet anybody's needs. And when I say anyone, I mean our industry partners. We can take the training on site. We can provide the training in the classroom. In situations where it's appropriate, we can do online training and we can do hybrids. So we have programs that can go anywhere from I don't know, once or twice meetings uh, all the way through your typical associate's degree program, which is usually about two years. Desiree, what does the outreach coordinator do? How do you spend your day? I mean, I, I imagine part of that is exposing target audiences to what you have available, the programs that you're offering. I, I mean, I feel like, I mean, Todd and I have been knee deep in the manufacturing space for a couple of years in terms of just doing this show, and we're, we're not as aware of these things as we should be. I, I suspect there's a lot of, of a potential target market for you that doesn't know about these programs. And, and I, I understand this is part of a national consortium. Talk about the kind of outreach that you have to do to expose your amazing programs to the right audience. We are basically taking an approach that if the communication line is out there, we are going to use it. So we have done everything from your traditional PR. We have a, a website that we created specifically for this. It's www.ampednh.com, A-M-P-E-D-N-H.com. And we are on, we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, we're on YouTube. I do presentations with uh, uh, job uh, creation agencies, workforce development agencies is a better way to describe it. I meet with uh, high school leaders, basically any group who wants to learn a little bit more, I will go in and tell them all about our programs. And so we're basically reaching out in any way we can. And what's really great, and I think the most exciting for me, is getting into the science themselves and seeing what they're doing, taking our partners on tours, not only of our education, labs, but also of the production facilities of our industry partners. And the things that you see that are being created here in New England will blow your mind. So we're reaching out in pretty much any way <laughs> that it's possible to reach out. All right. We'll be back with Desiree Crossley after this short commercial break. 
The Georgia Association of Manufacturers represents Georgia manufacturers in legislative, regulatory, and public relations matters. Founded in 1900, GAM also provides seminars, services, and guidance to manufacturers on a wide range of issues, including human resources, workforce development, public utility rates and energy, safety and health, employee benefits, environmental quality, and taxation. Active membership in GAM is open to all businesses in Georgia that are engaged in manufacturing. Learn more at gamfg.org. That's gamfg.org. All right, and we're back with Desiree Crossley, the Outreach Coordinator with Amped NH. Desiree, several times you've talked about the business leaders that you're partnering with in this whole endeavor. Talk a little bit about why those individual people decide to participate to begin with in this effort, and why do they continue to participate? Well, I I think there is a real need as they look forward, as I said, to kind of protect their own investments and to enable themselves for the amount of growth that they will be capable of in all other ways, but might be a little fearful of when it comes to do we or do we not have a pipeline of qualified and skilled workers uh, who can handle the high-tech technology that is now being used pretty much across the spectrum. I think one of the studies I saw said that by 2030, 77% of skilled baby boomers will have left the workforce. And that's a pretty staggering number when you look at it, especially from the point of view of a hiring manager. Desiree, who benefits most from your program? And the answer, a correct answer may be all of the above. Is it is it the young collegiate grad that's looking for something to do? Or is it someone who's 40s, 50s, who's who just needs a refresher in, in some of these skills? Well, certainly under the grant, we are focusing on the people who are in the trades or looking to get into the trades. So that would be 18 plus. However, I think we would be missing a big opportunity, again, not only for today, but again, if we're looking forward toward building this workforce in attracting uh, high school uh, graduates or soon to be graduates. I see this benefiting job seekers, career builders, and people who know that the skills that they currently possess may not be keeping up again with that technology that's advancing so quickly. So certainly, if you are someone who has been displaced in the workforce, someone who is fearful of being displaced, or someone who wants to make a change into a career-bound job, something that you know has a lot of potential, not only again today, but for the future, I'd say that this would benefit you. Desiree, you talked about trades there just a, just a second ago, and one skill that Todd and I hear about frequently is welding, as in if, if you have some welding skills, you can get a job immediately. Is the focus on those kinds of skills more or less than the more academic things? You talked about STEM earlier, or is mm-hmm. it a combination? It's definitely a combination because you need kind of the classroom-based, you know, things you can learn in a classroom type skills in order to understand and be able to be flexible and dynamic in that workplace. But you can have all the theory and know all the math in the world. And if you haven't used the equipment that is, are, you know, being used in these production facilities or the software, then they're going to spend some time training you. So the goal with Amped and Age is to ensure that people have both the hard skills meaning the actual technological, theory-based, math, and hands-on equipment skills, and soft skills, which is another deficit we're hearing about in the workforce, to be successful immediately in these careers. Desiree, we talk a lot about manufacturers themselves not being so reliant on, on government and government programs and those kinds of things, that they do have a role as well in fostering an environment that appeals to our younger generation to, to see a, a career in manufacturing as, as one that's full of intriguing opportunity and sexy and exciting. Talk about some, some of the partners that you work with and the things you've learned interacting with organizations who, who obviously see value in what you're doing. Is there more they can do to do more further outreach to, to younger people through internships or apprenticeships or those kinds of programs? Well, I think actually their doors are already pretty open to that type of opportunity. I think it's just a matter of actually kind of closing that loop and making those connections and then going into implementation. 
And I know that there had been talk for years, really, before the TAC grant and Ampton Age came along, that there was a need for this type of program. So this is actually an example of what you just talked about, where um, there was a recognized need, and people from both industry, uh, government, and education came together and said, we need to answer this, we need to make this work, how can we do it, and here we are. Desiree, I've got to believe, with just the, the extremely high demand for the kind of knowledge and skills that you're providing the training for, you know, the, there's you've got to be learning all kinds of things about how to do what you're doing better. Talk a little bit about some of the lessons you've learned inside AMP NH and things that you're looking at doing differently or more of. Are you speaking about in, in terms, terms of, of the training? In terms of operating the whole program and discovering what's required and reducing the time it takes to get the skills developed. Just I'm looking for some insight into best practices that you're picking up. I think keeping in close contact, again, with the, I like to call them stakeholders, because I think whether or not you're involved financially, um, as in, you know, you're, you're contributing money, I think everybody's a stakeholder in the future of advanced manufacturing in terms of the fact that it's our economic leader in the U.S. But um, what we could do better or what we're learning. This grant is actually a first for the community college system. Uh, first, when I say first, it's the first of this size uh, from the federal government. And so there's been a lot to learn. And I think just like advanced manufacturing, and this is kind of interesting, we are learning to operate in a very lean fashion. And that means that, you know, at the at outset, it's kind of measure twice, cut once, figure out what you need, and what's the fastest way to get there, and, and making sure that, you know, what we're building are solid programs that are really answering the need that's out there. So we are as much as possible, I think, operating in as much of a, a lean, you know, business model as we can. And I think that's working because it, it does mirror what today's manufacturers are doing with their lean manufacturing processes. Desiree, talk about the impact that the r rapid evolution of technology is having on, on the work that you're doing. We, we've had distributors on this show before who've said they spend most of their time just educating their target market on newer technology. And they're just, they're just they haven't bought into it. They haven't used it. They're scared of change. Uh, the shift that to the work you're doing and preparing this new workforce to, to dive into these opportunities. I, I just, I worry that, that there's a slower adoption rate on new technology and, and its rapid pace of change is a constant battle, I, I suspect. Talk about just the overall impacts that technology has on the work you're doing. Well, I think you said afraid, uh, afraid of change. And I, I think that is absolutely true. And not just here, but in a lot of, you know, facets of life for people in general. One of the things that we're doing is showing people, and when I say people, I mean the general public, I mean people who are already employed in this industry industry, people who are considering employment in this industry, and frankly, people who wouldn't have considered it before they talked to us. We're showing them how, frankly, technology is your friend, and it's it's not really a choice anymore for people. In order to be competitive in this world, both on local and global levels, you have to be on that cutting edge. And manufacturers have noticed this and have acted um, to make sure that they are on that cutting edge, and that means that their employees need to be right there with them. The good news is that technology, as long as it's behaving, generally makes our lives easier, makes us more productive, more efficient, and it helps us solve one of the misperceptions of manufacturing that I, I think still lingers, and that is that it's hard, physical, manual work that doesn't take you know a lot of mental uh, acuity, I guess. It's not that anymore. It is you need to be just as strong with your with your mind now as you are with your body. And the way that we get people to kind of take that leap is to show the high tech environments that our business uh, and industry partners provide for their workforce today. And then if you can imagine how much that might even advance in the next ten years, it's it's amazing. Desiree, I understand you have an open house, or I guess more appropriately, a series of open houses coming up. Why are you going to do that, and what will you be showcasing? We're really, really excited about this. On October 9th, we have open houses at every single one of our colleges. We are inviting the public in to see for themselves the high-tech environment, and this is the learning environment of adma advanced manufacturing. So it's like I said, I can talk and talk and talk and be as excited as I am about all of these new developments, but it really, really makes a difference when you see it. You walk into these labs and one of our colleges, the floor literally sparkles. <laughs> um, it, which is something that kind of had me laughing the first time I walked in there. But they are clean, they are well lit, they are well ventilated, it's a comfortable working environment, and students are working with top-of-the-line 
uh, technology these days. From CNC machines, we have 3D printers, we have advanced composites, technology equipment, welding. I was just up visiting the uh, welding lab at White Mountains Community College, and we also toured one of our business partners in uh, Vermont. And you'd be amazed at at some of this uh, learning equipment. At uh, the welding lab, I actually tried my hand <laughs> at virtual welding. <laughs> and I am sorry to say I will not be building bridges anytime soon. <laughs> you need to keep snack away from those things too. <laughs> Um, but the technology is incredible. And this is, you know, a piece of uh, a unit that you would start students off in because there's absolutely no risk of hurting the unit itself or obviously the student. But the immersive experience that you have working with this three, you got 3D goggles on, you've got your welding helmet on, and it can measure you with the, my, the most minute measurements to see how you're doing. And then it's kind of broadcast on the screen so an instructor can talk to you about how, you know, what you need to improve on, what you're doing well. In the meantime, other students can see how you're doing too and learn from your experience. So that kind of combines, and this spoke a lot to me, video gaming, which if we're talking about attracting the younger set, and the most highly technical uh, parts of welding that you can have in this learning environment. So that's just one example of how we're excited to be offering the public in to see um, equipment that I think will surprise them. I don't think the public is aware of how cool manufacturing is and the, and the, and the amazing, innovative, highly technical things that they're doing. I, you know, and he's talking about building bridges, uh, Desiree. I, I'm reading this book right now about the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge in the 1870s. And it's just unbelievable the differences in, in, in the struggles and, and the technology available now to do this stuff is just unbelievable. It's such an exciting place to be. I, part of the goals of this show, Todd, is, is to expose more people to just the amazing stuff happening in manufacturing. And there's an endless stream of it. Yep. Well, and th that's the most amazing part to me is, I, you know, I just mentioned welding, and that's one of our areas of, of focus. We have robotics and automation, which uh, you could go on for years about uh, the advancements in that recently. We have electronics and electromechanics, and the advanced machine tools, advanced composites, which we've all been hearing a lot about uh, in regard to the Albany and Saffron project going on in Rochester, and then engineering and programming. And with each of these sectors, there are products being made daily in New Hampshire and New England that change or save people's lives. And to me, that's incredible to see firsthand. And then again, you see these employees who are making these these products and, and they're happy with what they're doing and they know the importance of their work. Without saying the name of the company that I just visited, one of them, one of the employees was telling me about how after the tornado came through Joplin, they went down there with one of their, they make mobile medical units and uh, they went down there with one of them and basically opened up a hospital in less than 24 hours. Wow. <laughs> so you hear wow. things like that and it's incredible. And then when we're talking about composites, that's the, those are the blades that keep, you know, these next generation planes in the sky. And when we start talking about transportation and, and what a world without aerospace would be like, it starts to really blow your mind and you see how very, very important the products that are coming out of New Hampshire are to the world, really. Yeah, outstanding. Well, Desiree, I hate to say it, we're about out of time. Before we let you go, how can people get in touch with you and where can they learn more about Amped NH? Well, our website is ampednh.com, A-M-P-E-D.com. We would love you to visit there. We would also love people to visit us on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash slash amped nh i'm going to give that to you one more time <laughs> sorry it's at facebook.com slash amped nh we also have a twitter page which is twitter.com slash amped nh and we'd love to get the dialogue going there outstanding desiree crossley the outreach coordinator for amped nh it was great to have you thanks so much for joining us thanks for having me it is our pleasure all right well that wraps this conversation on behalf of our guest desiree crossley my co-host todd youngblood i am todd schnick we'll see you soon on manufacturing revival radio